Yo, yo, yiggity, yo, what's good? And welcome back to Philosophy Digestion, the podcast where we roast ideas and think pieces and the best thought content that history has saved for us today. And we take a specifically large poop on the people who thunk up these old ass ideas. My name is John Gavin, and I'm stoked to welcome you back. So sorry that we had a little break last week. I wasn't feeling the best, and we had a little microphone malfunction, so I figured it might just be the higher powers telling me that I gotta take a break. But no worries, we're back with a hot, hot episode on William Shakespeare. But to break us in, I'm going to do something that I think is kind of fun, and I am going to read a short story to you from one of the greatest modern uh, thinkers and philosophers of our time, Keith Johnstone, the author of Impro, Improvisation, and the Theater, because if you didn't know this, improvisation was illegal in the United Kingdom and most of the Commonwealth until the 1960s. If you didn't have your script approved and edited by the royal court or whatever they had in the United Kingdom, you weren't allowed to perform it. And so in the 60s, 70s later, Keith Johnstone wrote a book on the art of improvisation because it was legal. And in that book, he says a lot of different things. But here's a story that he wrote. I once had a close rapport with a teenage girl who seemed mad when she was with other people, but relatively normal when she was with me. I treated her as I would a mask. That is to say, I was gentle and I didn't try to impose my reality on her. One thing that amazed me was her perceptiveness about other people. It was as if she was a body language expert. She described things about them which she read from their movement and their postures that I later found out to be true. I'm remembering her now because of an interaction she had with a very gentle and motherly school teacher. We were in a beautiful garden where the teenager said she had seen God. And her teacher picked up a flower then said look at this pretty flower Betty and Betty filled with a spiritual radiance and said all of the flowers are beautiful ah the teacher replied blocking her but this flower is especially beautiful Betty rolled on the ground screaming and it took them a long while to calm her down nobody seemed to notice that she was screaming can't you see you can't see in the gentlest way possible the teacher had been very violent she was insisting on categorizing and selecting actually it's crazy to insist that one flower is specifically beautiful in a whole garden of flowers but but the teacher's allowed to do this and it's not perceived as violent Grown-ups are expected to distort the perceptions of the child in this way. Since then, I've noticed such behavior constantly, but it took a mad girl to open my eyes to it. And in much the same way as the teacher was trying to force this girl to categorize the quality of flowers, history and our teachers force us to categorize our beliefs and our ideas and our perceptions into pre-existing categories. Shakespeare wrote the plays that portrayed high society and love affairs that made kingdoms and built a culture in one united kingdom and its commonwealth his plays himself and his actors sat and expressed in the court of queen elizabeth 
Shakespeare was a Protestant reformist, which means that he thought that people could love Jesus and also not bow down to the Catholic Church. His versions of people like King Henry V, Richard III, and Macbeth defined how history remembers those kings. And his narratives united the English speakers and the people who shared those stories, but isolated the people who had their own memories about kings like Macbeth or that the Irish people should be able to play their fiddles, tell their improvised stories, and keep their potatoes. According to Queen Elizabeth's Lord Keeper, Mr. Nicholas Bacon, and how many degrees of Kevin Bacon are there? That is the real question. But anyway, the Lord Keeper, Mr. Nicholas Bacon, says that Queen Elizabeth was the first in her family to recognize that a monarch actually has to be ruled by popular consent or the people will revolt. And so she spent her life working with parliament advisors and spreading her pro-Elizabethan propaganda, painting herself and her dynasty as peaceful invaders who have fair trade and steal on behalf of the Commonwealth. She knew the value of comedy, tragedy, and history. As I hear, she was a persuasive woman. And these um, tools of comedy, tragedy, and history are all things that strike a chord to pit us, perhaps, against our enemies. She was a huge fan of content like the arts and the theater and the the press uh, of the, the printing press. She was a wise woman in power who often had players, you know, directors, musicians at her disposal. And she had house performers and understood the power behind her image, her brand and the stories that people told about her. Then, I like to keep that in mind and think about how uh, talented Shakespeare was and ask, why did Shakespeare make it out of his time just so famous? English speakers who study Shakespeare in high school tell the story of the crown, and it's pretty lame. And when the queen eventually dies, King James... A descendant of the man that killed Macbeth. You know what? We'll get into that. Shakespeare's narratives united the English speakers and the people that shared those ideas and isolated the kingdom of Ireland who had the paganism beaten out of them at the hands of the English Catholics to the point where they held heroes like St. Patrick for the rich and empowered English speakers who study Shakespeare to suddenly think that the Protestant Reformation is cool and Catholics are trash and saints are fake. You know, it starts to seem like the defining of which rose is the most beautiful is all just a ploy for the teachers to be telling you that you're or whatever they want, because it doesn't matter. It's just about the authority telling you what they think is correct and how you should be thinking. Teachers always ask students, or at least I felt like I was asked multiple times, why do we still study Shakespeare? And I never really got a great answer. Shakespeare was an icon and created content that we're all resharing today. He's pretty much the most popular content creator of his time. He had a ton of clout when it came to putting his interpretations on history. And... He wasn't all bad, but he definitely wasn't all good, if you know what I'm saying. And that's the light I'm trying to shine on today. I'm not a Shakespeare hater. I think that The Tempest is one of my favorite plays. Romeo and Juliet, one of my favorite teen dramas. I think that the stuff that he wrote is interesting, and it has its place. But he should not be pedestalized like we have him up on his weird throne today. And on that note, I am going to go brew my tea. So I will be right back. Be nice if there's any guests while I'm away. Think about the times that 
someone's told you that there's a specific flower in a garden of hundreds that is the most beautiful. Yes, hello, I am me and I am back. And today's topic is still William Shakespeare. So William Shakespeare was born in 1564. He's the son of an alderman and a glove maker. He was well educated probably, but also probably didn't go to college because at 18 he was married to Anne Hathaway. That's just fun because of, you know, the cinema classic Ella Enchanted. And college wasn't for Shakespeare anyway. He was too smart for that. He had too much, like, tacit wisdom, if you know what I mean. Like, he could actually write plays that people wanted to see. If you paid for college, nothing against you. I also have an expensive piece of paper hanging on my wall. This is just on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. I'm just saying, Shakespeare didn't have a piece of paper on his wall, and I'm talking about him. Anyway, so six months after his wedding to Ella Enchanted, twins are born, and Shakespeare as a douchebag, so he ups and leaves his family um, in Stratford-upon-Avon to go to the big city and uh, pursue his dreams of being a big star, you know, on the on the stage. And um, then his son dies, which is really sad, and that's where a lot of his content about Hamlet and dying and beauty and the shortness of life and being sad come from. So he gets he gets to England to live his dreams, and he very quickly becomes a content creator and head of the OG <clears throat> Elizabethan Theater, which people in the theater community just kind of say that because it references like a certain style of it's like an amphitheater that's like an indoor theater but there's no roof because at the time it was a serious fire hazard to keep that kind of thing well lit so they just had it outside so that the the moonlight and the stars because they didn't have any light pollution or they didn't have yeah i'm gonna go ahead and say they compared to what we have today they didn't have any light pollution so that they can see way more of what's going on at night. So live theater uh, was huge in the 1500s because the printing press was brand new, and so Shakespeare's influence as the king of theater was kind of like uh, Michael Jackson being the king of pop, and the printing press was like the MTV of the... 1500s like it's where everybody got their content their what they read the plays they saw the notes they passed the zines i don't know all of it the flyers and because it was new access was limited so it was only like one or two stations you know what i mean the mono culture of the 90s was originated in the 1500s Today, we all have printers and iPhones, so it's impossible to compete with, you know, Shakespeare and Michael Jackson because they had everybody's eyes, ears, mouths, and nose. And we're still studying what he wrote in the 1500s because he either captured something or told everybody to believe something, and his philosophy stuck. I believe that it's what caused John Locke to invent freedom in the 1600s, and so America could declare it for real for all men who that own property in 1776. So the, the people, the peasants, in the 1000s through 1500s, fought and died for their kings as the priest and God commanded them, because they were the lamestream media that showed everybody, all the sheep people, what to do. You know, God's the shepherd and we are the flock flock. And the lamestream media told stories of bad people and unjust kings of other kingdoms fighting. And that that was a great reason for you to fight. But also it told about societally accepted love, like in teen dramas. And like Shakespeare, a lot of the content shared by your local, you know, priest, street screamer, mystic, whatever, was ultimately 
a fiction shared, um, something meaningful and powerful that convinced people to take actions that, you know, maybe even God wouldn't agree with. To the people who were born poor and disabled, even priests were like, God made you that way because you deserve it and you don't have what it takes to make it in God's world that we live in. But if the year 2020 taught us anything, it's that both comedy and tragedy will come from murder in the streets and the people will rise. Shakespeare saw audiences feel connected to what's going on when the content that they consumed represented a perspective that they could identify with and a sense of humor that they understood. And it makes us feel like we're in on the joke and that like our perspective is valued on the issue as it's shared by others in a common story that we see and that we all understand. And tragedies are, you know, collective warnings, collective perils, fears that we all see play out on screen, on the stage, or, you know, wherever. But those things begin to feed each other. Comedy and tragedy. We gain a shared sorrow and perspective on the state of the world. And Shakespeare took full advantage of that, of those human truths in his writing, employing the things we all care about, like love and betrayal, war and legacy, in order to tell a good story. There has to be good and bad in conflict, and the characters have to be complicated like we all are, and feel the emotions that we each share with each other both in feeling them and in discussing them when we feel sad or guilty or uncomfortable for something it can be seen as an opportunity to feel elated when the problem is resolved for example if you don't care about climate change then you're not going to feel successful when natural environment saving legislation is passed and John Denver sings from beyond the grave, you'll be missing in on something that could be a very powerful shared experience with a like-minded community. And there are certain things that we each believe morally every person should rally behind. And Shakespeare was the first famous person to use that comedy tragedy in their content since the invention of the printing press and everyone knew what was up with storytelling and the printing press the british imperial rulers had a habit of using violence to squander songs and street theater and all stories the people told of their shared history that maybe differed from their neighbors ones that don't match the narrative of the king to rule over his peasants in God's name. Before the printing press and mass production of content in general, stories were really hard to censor. In Ireland, Celtic bards had their hands and tongues cut off and their fiddles and instruments were destroyed and outlawed. People who shit-talked the king or the Roman Catholic god in any kind of public performance had their limbs severed and strung up around town as an example. And as soon as they accepted the god of the one king in the Roman Catholic Church and they hand-copied a bajillion copies of the Bible. The English were actually like, um, here's a bunch of mass-produced Protestant Reformation content. Please give us all your potatoes, you dirty Catholics. Today, we have 39 plays left over of Shakespeare, 154 sonnets, and like six poems. People were talking about how relatable and engaging Shakespeare's plays and all of his limited series were to watch, even though I think the real key to him was that he was a great businessman. He used his talent to attract other talent, earn money, build that Elizabethan theater. 
invest in other endeavors and eventually follow his dreams of becoming a big star and retiring to the stage. High schools across the nation love to produce the comedies and tragedies like Hamlet, Taming of the Shrew, and Romeo and Juliet, but Shakespeare actually mostly wrote histories very much in favor of Queen Elizabeth and the Tudor dynasty in power. The spreading of ideas and information and rumors in favor of Queen Elizabeth through his Elizabethan theater spread misinformation and ruin the reputations of some otherwise reputable men, but also very violent and probably, you know, I don't think any of us are going to look that great in history's eyes. And that's something I'm going to have to talk about later. Comedies are how we bond in joy and redemption. Tragedy is how we bond in sorrow and shared warnings. What then are Shakespeare's histories? Let's just think about it today. Histories, especially on TV, are, you know, curated. They're hand-picked and filmed and snippet versions of real events from whoever has the expensive camera and the ability to put it in front of you. So all of the emotions that people feel when they watch a history or a docu-series, they feel about things and people in the real world like it's truth and news. I don't believe there's actually much of a cognitive difference between watching in re a reenactment that you believe and seeing something told to you on the news. Because if you believe it's true and you're exposed to the message more than once, you hear somebody else and they also believe it to be true, it's going to affect your actions in much the same way seeing the, a similar event reported on the news would. It blends the lines because our feelings about true events are based on feelings and stories that we have and share about them. And the stories that we all watch, the documentaries that you and your friends all care about, that we share with our communities are the most powerful because those we trust reinforce them. Sharing a sense of humor is is the best way to bond a group and another an innate one is to share a common understanding of history not just having a shared people or shared history but seeing history's narrative and the way that it happened and understanding the truth as one audience together is exactly what watching a play or watching a docu-series does. There are about four Shakespeare plays that cover the War of the Roses, which are the years of the uncles and the families using uh, propaganda and the philosophy of Game of Thrones, the church, politics, gossip, and of course war, you know, to um, kill each other and <laughs> try to sit on the Iron Throne, even though the dragon, which is... It seems to me like a lot of the plays that Shakespeare wrote were basically commissioned or like, uh, you know, like like he wrote a grant request or something to get funding for it. So he wrote Henry IV, part, parts one through three, which was the dude who killed King Richard III and married his niece. So he writes this history that's in favor of of Queen Elizabeth's grandparents, basically. And then he writes a bunch of teen dramas about how fighting is bad, like Romeo and Juliet, and the 1590s uh, rom-com Taming of the Shrew, uh, AKA he's just not that into shrew. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then Shakespeare writes Richard III. Then the queen finally invites Shakespeare to her court around 1595. He writes her a comedy, Midsummer Night's Dream which dream there is a dick named bottom so he got famous because he's funny like he got famous because his content was relatable like in his teen dramas and he was making some hardcore political statements getting all of the i don't know what you what political party they would be the tutors yeah he got all the tutors stoked excuse you Oh, sorry, did you just tutor? 
people listened to what he had to say and gladly gave them their money, which shows that they literally value what Shakespeare was writing about the Tudors and everything else. It's not like peasants had history books or copies of much to compare the word of Shakespeare to, but they did have the voices and stories that were not mass produced and were forbidden. The ones passed out in passed down in an oral or familial tradition. Some historians try to paint like a weird relationship between Queen Elizabeth and Shakespeare like they were in love or favorites or something. I don't know. Um, but they I'll tell you what, they were definitely in cahoots. She loved the Henry plays and whatnot so much that she contracted Shakespeare to write more, and she invited his theater troupe to frequently perform for her in her court. But to get these plays affirmed, they had to be reviewed by... Her, this dude in her court named Edmund Tilney. Her master of revels, Edmund Tilney, would filter out anything that the queen or the crown wouldn't like. Which began a tradition of the royal government requiring theatrical pieces performed to be approved by the royal government. And that was a huge barrier to street artists and, you know, theater of the oppressed. While a lot of his propaganda may have led to peace among the peasant people, it still left them slaves to God's queen and brainwashed into seeing history incorrectly and still getting most of the people's energy off of foreign bread and oil. Part of the brainwashing was pushing the narrative that King Richard III was bad and King Henry VI, oh, did I say four earlier? According to Mrs. Jones, Shakespeare makes Richard responsible for deaths that occur when he was a small child. He asks us to believe that a hunchback with a withered arm could be a successful medieval soldier, when in reality, a person with such handicaps would be unlikely to survive even one battle. When more than one version about the facts of a particular death exists in the historical record, Shakespeare always uses the one most hostile to Richard. In short, Shakespeare's portrayal of the last Plagnetic Capata, King of England, is truly a splendid example of political propaganda being derived from resources written specifically as propaganda, defined as the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of injuring a person. And Shakespeare and Henry V both paints a brave and encouraging picture of. English nationalism while in the play showing how bad the carnage of war is. It paints a very pro the Tudors and very anti war rebellion picture. And if you're someone who generally disagrees with the monarchy and wants to move towards democracy, then you may be faced with the wrath of Shakespeare's audiences. He got the ears of the people with his talented storytelling and the influence of the leadership by using his talents to further their agenda. You know, those who already have the most are being offered more in the hopes of a shared piece of the pie to be handed a larger scrap. So one of the most universally renowned writers just happens to be a propaganda master for Queen Elizabeth. And I think Shakespeare sold out for some old-fashioned bipartisan fake news to serve the Queen and in a way strengthened the crown in the middle of its horrible invasions and brutal dominations. But Queen Elizabeth eventually dies in 1603 and her jolly good spirits with her and she doesn't have any children. So her cousin, who is Mary, the fake Queen of Scots. Her cousin Mary's son, King James Bible, 
takes the English throne, but this is before he made the Bible, so it's just King James. So he takes the, the English throne, as he was the Prince of Scotland, the son of Mary, fake Queen of Scots. And so this makes the English nationalist supremacists super pissed, who were hoping for a more legitimate English king to emerge from one of the houses and start a war. You know, someone may be descended from, from an old king that they called Ed. And Shakespeare is still sitting in that royal court, and he's got his pen ready to shit the Scottish with stories of Macbeth. Hashtag, say his name, Macbeth. This is not the Scottish play. This is fucking King Macbeth's play, which was a tragedy, a history, and a warning. And it was first performed before King James the first and all of his homies in 1606 and it's based on the true Scottish king the last one hashtag king of the north hashtag say his name Macbeth and as the tale goes Macbeth meets some witches probably true and you know it's getting kind of late I think that you'll have to tune in next time to hear the rest of this story and the final maybe this is just part one for now but tune in next time to hear about Macbeth for sure. I am your host, John Gavin. You can follow me for updates on Instagram and TikTok at John Gavin TLDR. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you are having a good time, please rate, review, subscribe. That kind of stuff really does help. And if you're interested, our sources today are Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. The, the Kings and Generals documentary on War of the Roses, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, a course designed for middle schoolers by Miss Catherine Jones, English and European History by GCSC Henry and his ministers, BritRoyals.com. Special thanks to all of you for listening. You're the ones who make this worth it. Booyah. Have a great day. Oh, yeah.